Okay. Um, again, I'm Tim Randall. I'm a civil engineer, and I'm talking to, to you today from Denver, Colorado. So we have our National Reservoir Sedimentation and Sustainability Committee. This is composed of federal folks from federal agencies, local agencies, universities, uh, consultants, and some industry. Uh, that's a picture of our team. And here's a list of authors we have on, on the white paper. Uh, Greg Morris, uh, Michael Whalen, Brian Baker, George Annandale, Roland Hotchkiss, Paul Boyd, Bobby Manier, Stan Ekron, Kent Collins, Mustafa Altenecker, John Fripp, Nick Jonas, Kyle Jurchek, Sean Kimbrough, Matt Kondoff, Doug Reed, uh, Frank Weirich, Daryl Edison, John Shelley, Renee Vermeyer, uh, David Wagner, Peter Nelson, Kevin Jensen, and Desiree Tolis. So it's quite a, uh, a group of people that we've assembled for this. So we wanted to get across the message that reservoir sedimentation needs to be managed every year to sustainably manage storage capacity for future generations. And otherwise sedimentation will steadily degrade our ability to regulate water supply and reduce flood risk. And all rivers naturally transport sediment. And we're talking about clay, silt, sand, gravel, cobble, and boulders. And reservoirs tend to trap this sediment. And you know, we often classify sediment by particle grain size, clays being the smallest, then silts and sands, gravel, cobble, boulder. Sometimes we trans or classify it by how it's transported, whether it's suspended load or, or bed load. And sometimes by the availability, is it uh, wash load, those particles so fine that they're just passing through, they don't really interact with the stream bed and banks very much, that's usually silt and clay or is it bed material load, usually the sand and gravel? Uh, here's just an example from Lake Powell. Uh, you can see the, the delta when the reservoir was new. This was all open water. Here's to uh, give you an idea, some worldwide sediment yields. The, the darker colors are some of the highest sedimentation rates. You can uh, see uh, places in uh, like the Himalayas uh, have very high sedimentation rates along the Chilean coast of South America, uh, parts of the US. Um, but sediment gets eroded from all watersheds. And here's just a, an example from the United States where this happens to be in Washington state. Looks like a, a nice clear reservoir on a sunny day. You don't really see any sediment at all. But if you were to get in an airplane and look at the reservoir, uh, so the area up here is where the dam is. That's where that last photo was taken from. And here you can see the coarse sediments forming a delta up here. There's a lot of finer sediments that are underneath the water you can't see. If we go back to the same area in, in 1939, there was no sediment delta. And by 1994 and 2009. Some people might look at this as, well, this is just natural part of the river environment, but it's it's not, it's um, caused by the reservoir. It's those sands and gravels depositing, forming a delta. Uh, another way of looking this, uh, if we look at a longitudinal profile of a river, and if we put a dam on, and then after some period of time, we see sediment deposition. And then by storing that sediment in the reservoir and releasing clear water downstream, we can often have channel degradation uh, below the dam. Here's just another way of looking at it. Here we have a, a new uh, reservoir and a, and a dam. And then initially we get some period of delta coarse sediment deposition up here and then the finer sediments go a little further downstream before they deposit and they can often reach all the way to the dam. And then after some period we begin to reach the end of our sediment design life where the outlet works may become buried, especially if there's wood uh, material in here that can be kind of like a beaver dam uh, in, in consistency with, with logs and sediment and can plug up the outlets. And then if you go to a more severe case where the delta has actually reached the dam, very little storage capacity left. And we have examples where dams have had to been removed 
when they reach that situation. So without reservoir sediment management, the eventual cost can be expensive. There's the lost storage capacity over time with increased water demands over time, uh, buried or impaired dam outlet, uh, reservoir water intakes, boat ramps and marinas. Uh, we can also have abraded turbines or outlets or spillways, uh, reduced surface area for lake recreation, and upstream channel aggradation and increases in flood stage and groundwater. And downstream channel degradation, infrastructure erosion and habitat loss, and eventually uh, dam decommissioning. And then uh, if the water storage is still needed, new dam construction needs to be, is needed to create replacement water storage. And with 90,000 dams in the national inventory, the best dam sites have already been taken. So if we have to build new dams at other locations, it's going to be more expensive. The real estate's more expensive. The sites are more complicated. They're gonna require more dikes. Uh, it just isn't as cost effective. Here's an example of San Clemente Reservoir out in California. This was an aerial photo in 1994, and there it is in 2013. Uh, this dam was removed because it was full of sediment and had some dam safety issues. And this figure here was uh, put together by Brian Baker with the Army Corps. Uh, let me walk you through it. So we're looking at timeline from 1900 all the way up to the present and a little bit of extrapolation beyond. And in the vertical axis, we're plotting the cumulative storage capacity for the nation. This comes from the National Inventory on Dams. Uh, there's a, a dark blue line up here, and it's showing that over time we were building a lot of dams and, and creating a lot of storage capacity. And then it's kind of leveled off. I mean, there's still a few dams being created, but the really big ones have been built. And so the smaller ones that are being added in, in small bits aren't really changing this curve much. Uh, and this top curve ignores the losses to sedimentation. And we don't really know... Um, precisely what those losses are, but we have some estimates. Uh, we have this line representing a, a lower rate of loss and a higher rate of loss, but we can see we're on the decline. And if we look um, here, we can, we can see we have about as much storage capacity today uh, as we had in the, the 1970s. The difference being the 1970s, we were still building uh, more capacity and now we're on a, on a downward trend. And also we can see that the population is increasing and the Census Bureau projects that will be around 400 million, you know, by, by 2060 or 2070. If we look at the storage capacity on a per capita basis, that's what this curve looks like. And so it's the same timeline and here it's the cumulative storage capacity, but now we're looking at it per person. And we can see that we were building a lot of capacity. Uh, we're outpacing the increases in population. Uh, but since around uh, the mid 1970s, we've been on the decline, even without sedimentation, when you account for the sedimentation, we're on a, a more rapid decline. So on a per capita basis, we have about as much storage today per person as we did in the 1950s. And again, in the 1950s, we were building a lot of storage capacity, whereas now we're on a downward trend. So the long-term outlook, outlook the, water, the population water demand will increase over time while reservoir storage capacity reduces due to sedimentation. And in some regions, climate change may lead to increased hydrologic variability. So more floods and more droughts. And uh, it's easy to see how droughts can reduce the water supply reliability. And when you finally get uh, floods following droughts, uh, that's a great time to refill the reservoirs with water, uh, but it also fills the reservoir with sediment and at an accelerated rate because the droughts uh, often stress the vegetation. And when we finally get rainfall following that, it can lead to a lot more soil erosion with the vegetation in a stress state. And sometimes droughts lead to wildfire and rainfall following wildfires can really increase the sedimentation rate. So even though we're refilling the reservoirs, the, the sediments are also coming in at a faster rate so that when we start that next drought cycle, we have less water uh, to get through the next drought than we had in the previous drought. 
So then we get into a, a res concept of reservoir uh, sediment design life. A lot of people like to think, well, when will the reservoir be completely full of sediment? And that's an interesting question. Sometimes it's hundreds of years. Uh, but if we think about the design life, the, the idea was to put the out, outlet works um, above the sediment volume over that sediment design life. So it's typically 50 or 100 years. And for reclamation and Car Army Corps of Engineers, it's typically 100 years. A Natural Resource Conservation Service, typically 50 year sediment design life. But you estimate the volume that you expect to occur over that time, uh, estimate the spatial distribution within the reservoir, and then design the dam's outlet to be above that sediment level during the sediment design life. And then you just simply defer the sediment management to future generations. Here's an example of this in place Peonia Reservoir in Colorado. Uh, they put this uh, outlet 70 feet off the reservoir bottom. And they did so because they built this dam on Muddy Creek and it did get a lot of sediment and had a 50 year sediment design life here. And here's a person for a scale. And 50 years later, uh, we can see the top of the outlet right there. And they had plugging problems. They're using a long reach excavator to try and, and uh, pull wood and sediment from around their plugged outlet. Uh, and then sediment, sedimentation impacts on recreation, uh, you know, burial of boat ramps or reduced surface area for recreation. And then sand and gravel is very abrasive to dam outlets, turbines and spillways. And then we can increase the water surface and groundwater upstream of the, the reservoir and for quite some distance sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, reduce channel conveyance capacity and increase flooding. And here's some pictures from Paul Boyd. I think that's Paul right there. He's not actually walking on water. He's a great guy, but um, it's just become so shallow. He's able to, to walk out there and this boat of course is on shallow. And here's um, the town of Niobrara had to be relocated even though it's 10 miles upstream from the reservoir. So we have uh, also some dam safety concerns. Uh, increased flood stage increases the magnitude and the probability of downstream flood releases. Uh, the reliability of the dam outlets will decrease due to plugging and abrasion. Increased sediment loads on the dam may increase dam failure probability and reliability of spillways may decrease due to, over time due to abrasion. So the existing reservoir practice in the United States and much of the world reservoirs are functioning as originally authorized and designed, which also means they trap sediment. And people may not be aware that the numerous benefits provided by the nation's reservoirs are not sustainable over the long term without sediment management. So the old best management practice was no action, let the reservoir eventually fill with sediment and hopefully after you retire, and then that poses an intergenerational inequity issue. So the first generation, and it takes about 20 years to conceive, plan, design, and construct a dam and reservoir. And then the second generation starts receiving the benefits. They're repaying the, the capital cost and paying the operation and maintenance cost. And the third generation continues that, receiving the benefits, repaying the capital cost, and paying those O&M costs. And the fourth generation is kind of where we're at today, is just paying the O&M cost. The capital costs have largely been paid and they're not paying for sediment management. And then the last generation gets stuck with a retirement bill and then has to develop new water storage uh, elsewhere at a higher cost. So another model for this is converting reservoirs from the design life paradigm to a sustainable use paradigm. So in the first option up here, we have the traditional life of reservoir design approach where you design it for some period of time and then you just decommission it. And what we're talking about now is, is the traditional design approach modified by sustainability intervention where you start off with the design life paradigm, but then you switch and start using the sustainable use paradigm. And for new projects, you could start off with a sustainable design uh, from the beginning. And here's a, a way of looking at this is highly simplified, but this is uh, just illustrates the concept of sediment design life management. On this uh, bottom scale of the graph, we're looking at um, uh, time and years. And 
zero is when a dam and reservoir first come online. Uh, the negative numbers are just prior to that getting the planning, design, and construction. Uh, these negative numbers here on the vertical scale are just relative costs. So these are the costs you incur uh, before the dam is put into service. And then you have these blue bars, which are the benefits. They're decreasing over time because we're losing storage. And whether we're monitoring the loss or not, we're still uh, losing storage. And the green is the operation and maintenance cost. And then eventually you get to where you have to start managing sediment and then maybe decommission. And then you're having to restart the planning, design and construction costs. And then you start this process over again. Uh, another way of looking at this though is uh, in the sustainable sediment, sus sediment sustainability management concept where you probably pay more money in the beginning uh, to make the dam sustainable. Uh, you're getting the benefits, you're paying the operation and maintenance costs, but you also pay a set of a management cost every year. And you do that indefinitely, but then you keep the benefits of the reservoir indefinitely. And one of the things that comes into play with economics is the discounting concept. And so I just have a few slides to illustrate this. Here we're looking at uh, time and years on the bottom scale and the discount. So if we have something uh, today, whether it's $100 or $100 million, it's in 30 years at an 8% discount rate, it'll be worth about 10% of what it was today when you apply discounting. If you had a 5% discount rate, it'll be worth 10% of its value in about 47 years. If you apply the 2.875% discount rate, it'll be at 10% of its value in 81 years. But there are other ways of applying discount rates. There's a hyperbolic method rather than the exponential. Uh, that would have a, a much slower rate of discounting. And there's also an intergenerational discount formula that would also uh, not, not discount quite as rapidly. And so just to show why this matters, here we're looking at long time scales. So uh, 10 years, uh, 150 years, 300, all the way up to 500 years. And we're looking at a stream of benefits and costs for a reservoir. So on the top here are the, those benefits and these are the cost of initially building uh, the dam and having to rebuild it, decommission, rebuild it, decommission. If we apply an exponential discount rate to all this, the yeah, so this is kind of where we are presently with a lot of dams. Um, but if we apply the discounting, we see that really nothing matters at, at a 2.875% rate. Uh, after 150 years, none of the cost and benefits really matter because we're so heavily weighting the present. Uh, if we were to apply an intergenerational discounting method, now you can see that the future cost and benefits still do matter. So let me switch now and talk about some of the solutions uh, for this. There are generally four classes of solutions. One. Uh, is to reduce the sediment yield from the upstream watershed, uh, maybe to get it back to natural levels. Uh, and then two, routing the sediments either through or around the reservoir so they don't deposit in the reservoir. And three, for those sediments that have deposited, either remove or redistribute those uh, sediment deposits. And this, um, this figure has a lot of complexity. I'm going to uh, show this in some other slides. There's also an adaptive strategies concept where you're just you're better dealing with the fact that you're losing storage capacity, maybe reallocating storage or modifying the intakes or raising the dam um, or water loss and con control and conservation or and then ultimately dam decommissioning. And monitoring is needed for all of these options to be successful. So the first category is reducing the sediment yield. Uh, that would be reducing the sediment production from that upstream watershed through soil erosion control and revegetation, a landslide erosion control, channel erosion control. Uh, a lot of times it's land management practices. In the United States, I think we do a pretty good job of land management, uh, but there could be opportunities to uh, decrease that 
some. I think in third world countries, there's probably a lot more opportunities to uh, reduce the sediment yield. And then uh, there's also the concept of trapping sediment uh, in other dams upstream of the reservoir, sometimes large dams or small check dams and farm ponds, uh, gully stabilization, uh, stream channel stabilization and restoration can also reduce the sediment yields. So here's just a couple of examples from Japan. One, they're stabilizing a landslide there. Another one, they're building a check dam to trap the, the sand and gravel before it gets to the reservoir. Then of course you have to keep excavating the sediment out of this, uh, but there could be some commercial application. And then there are options for routing the sediment. Uh, here we have the, the typical uh, dam and reservoir just on the stream and it captures uh, a lot of the sediment that comes into it. Uh, another idea is to build some kind of a bypass channel or tunnel where you divert the sediments around the reservoir. And the third option is you put the, the dam and reservoir off stream in some other maybe minor tributaries area and then you divert the water into the reservoir but really try to avoid diverting the sediment. There are techniques available to help help do that. Here's an example from Japan where uh, Japan's a steep country. They get a lot of uh, rapid rates of uplifts. They have a lot of erosion. They have earthquakes that shakes things loose and they have typhoons that wash a lot of that sediment down. They've kind of run out of sites for dams and the reservoir storage is becoming uh, quite valuable to them now. So they don't, they can't afford to um, lose any more sediment or, or lose any more storage capacity. So here they built a, a tunnel the entire length of the reservoir. They built a diversion dam upstream and when the sediment concentration coming into the reservoir gets high enough, they open the gates to that tunnel and this is the exit of that tunnel right here. Another option is uh, some places in the arid west we get very high concentrations of sediment coming into the reservoir and those concentrations can be so dense that the sediment laden water is heavier than the reservoir water. It actually dives and forms a turbidity current and flows along the bottom of the reservoir. There's an example from Taiwan where in a single typhoon, they lost one quarter of their entire reservoir storage capacity uh, through this phenomena. So there they built a tunnel uh, through the abutment so they can release this turbidity current uh, during the next typhoon. So if you have the turbidity current and it gets to the dam and you have a, a low level outlet or tunnel, you can vent this right on out. It doesn't get past all the sediment, but it can pass a significant amount. And there's also a pressure flushing of sediments near the dam outlet. This happens to be an example from Cherry Creek Reservoir near Denver, Colorado. Paul Boyd's been involved in this every spring where they open up each of the outlet gates and flush sediment from just around the outlets. They don't get a lot of sediment out that way, but it does clear the outlets. Uh, another example from Spencer Dam, which was, and I think the spelling of this may not be quite right, but uh, this dam did fail, but before it failed, they were annually drawing the reservoir down and flushing a lot of the sediments through. And there's also the uh, remove or redistribute sediments. There's the mechanical or hydraulic dredging or dry excavation. Uh, the transport by slurry pipeline, truck, or conveyor belt for discharge to the downstream river channel, disposal site, or beneficial use. Usually if you're going to do this long term, you just don't have enough land area to keep storing the sediment. It probably needs to go downstream unless there are severe contamination issues. And there could be beneficial uses, and if there are, that's great. Uh, soil augmentation for agriculture, land development, construction fill, concrete aggregate, wetland or other shallow water habitat creation, shoreline beach development or augmentation, and offsetting the downstream channel incision when it's put downstream. Our subcommittee on sedimentation, uh, which is now being retired, but the before it was, the subcommittee encourages all federal agencies to develop long-term reservoir sediment management plans for the reservoirs that they own are managed by the year 2030. And these management plans should include either the implementation of sustainable sediment management practices or the eventual retirement of the reservoir. Uh, the U.S. Society and Dams adopted a very similar resolution except they call on all owners of all dams to do the same thing. 
So for a reservoir sediment management strategy to work, it's probably not feasible to go in and try and capture past decades of sedimentation, but rather focus on managing uh, the recent uh, sedimentation each year. And over the long term, sediment will have to pass downstream or supply some other beneficial uses. And so by restoring the sediment continuity, uh, sediments passing through a reservoir may slow, stop, or reverse the downstream channel erosion and degradation. And over the long term, sediment management cannot be allowed to overwhelm the downstream transport capacity. So maybe refilling some sediment is good, but you don't want to lose the channel either. You don't want to completely bury it. And some downstream sediment deposition may be acceptable, so long as there's not unmitigated harm to people, property, or, or native species. And sediments released downstream may help in nat uh, native species, but they could harm introduced species. An example would be the endangered humpback chub in the Grand Canyon uh, and other native fish. They actually need uh, sediment uh, for their life history. Uh, they use ter sediment as a, or turbidity as a cover to hide from predators. And uh, there is also a need for sediment monitoring. And the first obvious signs of a sediment problem may be the plugging of a dam outlet or reservoir water intake with wood and sediment. And reservoir surveys are periodically needed to monitor and forecast problems and avoid crisis management. And the reservoir monitoring costs have significantly decreased over time. I think my first survey back in 82, we had um, three boats and nine people when we were getting uh, one data point along a line every 25 feet and line spaced, uh, survey line spaced every 300 feet apart. Now with just two people, uh, you can collect millions or tens of millions of data points in a, in a few days. So they've substantially decreased over time uh, and the quali quantity and quality of the data have dramatically increased. We've got survey grade GPS, we've got multi-beam depth sounders and, and less personnel. Uh, this happens to be Lake Mead and Hoover Dam and and more monitoring and reporting is needed to track and forecast sedimentation of publicly available and updatable reservoir sedimentation database is also needed. Uh, we started that amongst the federal agencies. It's just not available to the public just yet. Uh, and the reservoir should be surveyed at minimum intervals based on the rates of sedimentation and reservoirs should be surveyed after significant inflow floods like greater than 10 year flood peaks. And there's also a, a reconnaissance technique uh, where you would survey a longitudinal profile. This happens to be Lake Mead. So we're looking here at uh, miles upstream from Hoover Dam, and we're looking at elevation. Uh, this line here is the profile of the Colorado River through the Lake Mead area before uh, Hoover Dam. And in, by 1948, we could see the sedimentation had filled in this much, and by 1963 and 2001. So with this one picture, uh, you get a, a pretty good understanding of what's happening in sedimentation. So this is just one survey line up the reservoir. That's even less expensive than surveying uh, all of the areas of the reservoir. And there's now also surrogate technologies available to continuously measure sediment inflow and outflow uh, through uh, things like hydroacoustics and turbidity sensors. So uh, conclusion and monitoring is now more important because most of the reservoirs are in the second half of their sediment design life, and a decade or more may be needed to plan and implement sustainable sediment management plans. And no action will lead to the eventual retirement of the dam and reservoir. And when looking at the economics of this, we have to compare the cost and impacts of reservoir sediment management with the cost of eventually retiring the reservoir and having to construct additional water storage somewhere else. And future generations should also be considered when choosing a reservoir sediment management plan. And sustainable reservoir sediment management may harm introduced sport fisheries, but the reservoirs can't trap sediment forever. And releasing sediments at a point downstream of valuable fisheries may be a, a, beth, a method to avoid those impacts. And I wanted to uh, say, just take a few minutes and talk about a research prize competition we've been running uh, to try and come up with less expensive ways to collect, transport, and deliver sediment from reservoirs. So prize competitions have been used uh, 
in a variety of things to address tough problems where solutions have been evasive or expensive uh, by opening up the problem area to previously untapped uh, domains, getting a broader group of people looking at it. And so uh, we may find that people have never really thought much about reservoirs, uh, may have ideas that others haven't considered. So we had a, a collaborative process between uh, Reclamation Corps of Engineers, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, Natural Resource Conservation Service, and American Rivers, and we offered a, a $75,000 prize purse. Our objectives were to seek theoretical innovative solutions to remove sediment from reservoirs uh, to sustain or prolong their useful life. We we're looking at uh, reducing the cost of collecting and transporting sediment, uh, efficiently collecting sediment from depths greater than say 40 or at least uh, uh, 60 feet, uh, delivering sediment to the downstream river channel ways that reduce the environmental impact to aquatic resources and infrastructure. So we had 168 uh, people register as solvers. Uh, some of the solutions were just some vague ideas, but we got 40 solutions from uh, in a set of who uh, deemed that those were worth judging. And of those 40 solutions, we awarded uh, cash prizes to four of them, won the top tier, uh, won Baja, uh, I'm gonna mess up his name, but uh, he had an idea for transporting coarse uh, sand and gravel in capsules through pipelines. So if you think about uh, going to a, uh, a drive up uh, bank where you may put uh, your ID or checks in a, in a tube and it transports through, that's kind of the idea, except instead of through a pneumatic or air, it would go through water and the uh, capsules would be filled in sand and gravel as opposed to checks and, and cash. Uh, another idea he had was transporting clay sediments. So these would be compressed into logs and then transporting through a pressurized pipeline. Uh, also, uh, Lawrence Kearns of Chicago had an idea for a, a sediment snake, a submersible robot for collecting uh, sediments. This uh, would be a submerged pipeline laying on the bottom of the reservoir and using water pressure would, the idea would be to collect sediments into the pipe and and transport it to wherever we needed to go. And uh, another guy, uh, David Orlobeck, uh, had an idea to use flexible augers to move sediment from the bottom up to the, to the reservoir surface. And then we had uh, two solutions, one uh, partial surpri uh, cash prizes, uh, one Aaron K Hinterman, a cryo dredger, basically using inert liquid nitrogen to try and freeze sediments and then bring them up to the surface that way. And uh, another guy, uh, Pradeep um, uh, and Oliver had an idea to collect sediments using adapted electrocoagulation methods. So some interesting ideas. Uh, you can go to this website if you wanna learn more about the prize competition. And we're ge gearing up to have stage two of this competition. And with this uh, stage, we're looking at testing new prototypes in the laboratory or small scale uh, field tests. And this one would have a much larger price purse than in stage one, and it's planned to launch in the summer of 2020. And there are a, a number of uh, resources out there on reservoir sedimentation, uh, quenching the thirst by George Annandale, reservoir sedimentation handbook by Greg Morris and, and Fan, also dealing with the reservoir sedimentation, uh, Boris and Rispum. Uh, there's American Geophysical Union publications uh, managing sediment in Utah's reservoirs. Uh, our team has also uh, presented and, and recorded uh, six webinars on the topic, and they're all uh, available on YouTube. You can download them for free, watch them anytime you want. Uh, one on reservoir sedimentation management, big deal, why should we even care about it, uh, by George Annandale. Uh, one on sediment management alternatives at reservoirs by uh, Greg Morris, uh, Sedimentation Management for Multipurpose Reservoirs, a federal perspective from myself and Paul Boyd. Uh, permitting for Reservoir Sediment Management, uh, Roland Hotchkiss and David Olson. Reservoir Sedimentation Monitoring by Greg Morris. And Economics of Sustainable Reservoir Sediment Management by George Annandale and Roland Hotchkiss. And there's also the International Hydropower Association, 
sediment management hub. And, uh, and that was all I had. I, I sure thank you for your attention and I'll turn it back over to Sandy. Thanks, Tim. Um, that was a lot of great information. Um, and you can certainly send us any questions um, out there and we'll uh, get those to the panelists. We also have um, Paul Boyd joining us today as a panelist uh, from the Corps of Engineers in Omaha. And Tim Kalman, uh, he is with South Dakota Geological Survey um, and is also a board member for MSAC. Um, I guess one of the things that came to mind uh, to me uh, during your presentation, Tim, was uh, I guess, does your uh, agency have any new dams under consideration or uh, maybe Paul could address this too. I'm just curious if uh, the same uh, discount rates uh, and economic models are used to analyze new dams today as they were decades ago. I think the, the principles and guidelines have recently got uh, cast under a slightly different name, but they're, they're still there and they're, they're still mandating the interest rate. Uh, one economist told me that it prescribes the interest rate but doesn't necessarily prescribe the method, although I'm, I'm not an economist, so I'm not sure how that's being looked at. Although one thing to keep in mind is as the sedimentation problems have become a lot uh, closer in time, uh, the discounting rates don't matter as much. It makes a huge difference if the if the issues aren't going to happen for a number of years, but since they're not that far in time, uh, the discounting won't matter as much for the existing dams. And Paul, maybe you want to add something to that. Well, we're not in the uh, we're not in the business of building uh, large dams at the current time, like uh, some of the examples we've had here. We are building still in in collaboration with uh, uh, cities or municipalities, uh, some small flood control and uh, flood risk reduction uh, recreation type of facilities. And, and yes, they still have to meet the, you know, the benefit cost ratio traditional process. Um, I, I would say that the, while the economics uh, may be uh, generally the same, uh, I do see a significant increase in the analysis of sedimentation and what that means for the future of the reservoir. Uh, Tim showed a, uh, a, a slide early in the presentation where, uh, you know, we considered uh, no sustainability and then a sustainable intervention uh, and then at the bottom a sustainable design. Uh, and I would, I would offer that even on these small reservoirs, uh, where applicable, uh, that idea of sustainable design plays a much larger role in the design process uh, than it did on many of these reservoirs that we're having these problems with. Yeah, good point, Paul. Um, one of those graphs you had at the beginning of the presentation um, where you mentioned that, uh, what was it, the storage capacity today per capita was similar to that uh, in the 1950s. Was that for the United States? Um, yes, this is for the United States. Uh, this was okay. uh, taken from the National Inventory of Dams. And I guess how fast is that declining over time? Um, well, in, in the other graph too, you can kind of see the actual capacity. So, you know, we're, the, the trends are not good, especially when you consider the population keeps going up. And so if, if we have more demands on our water over time, whether it's for agriculture or municipal or 
industrial, we're, we're having less storage to deal with the higher demand. Um, Tim, I, Tim Kalman, did you have any, uh, anything to add? Oops. Sandy, Tim may be on mute. I see the uh, mute icon on his video chat. Okay, I'm trying to. <laughs> And it's not. Can you hear me now, Sandy? Yes, I can. Yeah, there. Here we go. Okay, yeah, I was on mute, sorry. Yeah, just a, a couple things that I would add. Um, you know, Tim Randall made some good points about uh, the behavior of reservoirs that are, are experiencing a large amount of sedimentation. And there's a couple of, of properties or characteristics he pointed out that we definitely see in the Lewis and Clark Lake Reservoir. But one is that uh, floods fill the reservoir at an accelerated rate. And so we've you know, de measured that in the Lewis and Clark Lake Reservoir and, and found that during high flow years uh, through the main stem Missouri River, um, the, amount, the uh, amount of sedimentation advances into the reservoir at about 10 times the rate uh, of average. So I think that's important to consider, uh, especially since we've had some recent, quite a few recent high flow years. Uh, also, if you know, we look at precipitation patterns and runoff in the basin, uh, the projections there are that these will continue to grow. Uh, it could mean more high runoff years uh, than normal in the future, which would mean an advanced rate of sedimentation. The other thing is that something that doesn't get discussed a lot, but Tim Randall had mentioned also in one of his slides, is that sedimentation in these reservoirs like Lewis and Clark Lake impacts just the more than just the reservoir, and it also has downstream impacts. And so we definitely see that in uh, downstream of, of Gavin's Point Dam. And that's, I think, especially important because we have a, a 50 mi 59 mile length of a wild and scenic designated river uh, that's part of the National Park Service uh, that exists immediately downstream of Gavin's Point Dam. And certainly we're seeing impacts to that wild and scenic river as well because of the sedimentation that's being stored above the dam. There's channel degradation happening, which is leading to uh, loss, of, loss of habitat. Um, you know, one of the obvious ones is lack of sandbar building, but also there's been a, a lot of loss of backwater and wetland habitat on the adjacent floodplain because of that uh, bed degradation that's being caused by the sediment storage above, above the dam. Uh, another uh, comment or maybe a question I have for Tim Randall is, um, you know, you had alluded to the different models out there of, of envisioning how a reservoir should operate, and you have the slide that shows here's the, tr the traditional life paradigm where you just let it fill up and then maybe remove the dam. Um, in the future, there is reservoirs would be uh, constructed with a sustainable life paradigm but we certainly, with Lewis and Clark Lake especially, are in that middle paradigm where uh, initially we were looking at a traditional life, um, you know, just a finite uh, uh, life to the reservoir of about 200 years, and then it would fill up. And then we're getting, I think, to that inflection point now where people are starting to feel the effects of it filling up. And the questions that are really coming up is, uh, what next? Um, we don't necessarily want this to be something that continues on the traditional life paradigm, but we're getting to that point now where we have to decide how do we convert from that traditional life paradigm to the sustainable use paradigm. So I'm curious, uh, Tim, if 
there are other examples out there, either nationally or internationally, where uh, the people that are benefiting, the stakeholders in those reservoirs, have gotten to this point and had to make that conversion, and what are the social and economic drivers that they are dealing with to make that conversion. Now, it's happening a lot in Taiwan and Japan and, and China to some extent, uh, because the water storage has just become too valuable. You know, water is kind of funny in some ways in the West. It's, on the one hand, it's not that expensive to purchase, but it's priceless in another context, because if you don't have it, you can't do much of anything. Uh, and so when you look at that, if you have to have the water stored somewhere and you don't, and you're losing your storage, all of a sudden as that storage becomes scarcer and scarcer, uh, the value of that storage is gonna go up. And then I think you also have to compare it to what if you don't preserve it, then what? Do you lose all the hydropower flood control benefits of the project and, and what's the value of that? So I think when economists were initially looking at these issues, uh, for one thing that the discount rates they were using at that time, when you went much past 50 years, things didn't matter. And no one ever considered the cost of having to decommission the dam or to retrofit or, or to manage the sediment. It just wasn't part of the equation. And even if they had included it, the discount rates are such that it wouldn't have mattered much anyway. Uh, but now we're here and these costs do matter and it becomes more important to consider all the costs and all the benefits of one action versus another and then try to make informed decisions based on on those thorough economic analyses. We did have a couple questions come in. Um, one comment and question, uh, John Remus recently commented to the Mr. Rick committee that the U.S. does the worst job in the world of managing sediment. Why <laughs> was this not thought of when reservoirs were originally constructed? Yeah, and I think it's the economics. Uh, looking at the discount rate, those long-term issues just didn't matter because the exponential discount formula and a, and a higher rate basically says nothing matters much but the present and the near term and things in the long term just don't matter those future generations we don't care about that's why there's these other methods now like intergenerational equity that say that the future generations do matter i would i would echo those uh comments as as we follow back and and especially at, at lewis and clark lake gavin's point dam we've been uh digging all the way back and 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 tracking how it was developed by the core and through its design memorandum and how it migrated from the original pick sloan act to the project that we we see today um and, and throughout that pro process um, the designers did um, uh, a very good job of estimating the sediment load that they expected to come into the reservoir. Uh, the number we now see 70 years later on, the, on an annualized basis uh, is quite close to what they estimated with some basic measurements in the 1940s. Uh, but there is no consideration or there was no consideration for um, the impacts of that sediment to the the, the life uh, of the reservoir. There was a life calculated uh, based on that estimate, um, but um, sediment. I, one of the reasons I think may, in many cases sediment may have not have been considered because um, one, there wasn't a lot of science on good ways to manage sediment, and two. Um, the the ways or some of the activities uh, that we see for managing sediment now uh, are part of the infrastructure of the dam, uh, low level flushing gates or bypass routes or or any of that, um, and those in in those cases would have added cost to the dam, um, and and. In the case of Pick Sloan and the way this was was done, uh, the, the the core and reclamation were given these large lump sums of money, 
um, in some cases not specific to one project, uh, and asked to get as many of their projects in the ground um, as they could at the time. So, um, you know, Dan's question is a valid one. Um, why was it not thought of? Um, and 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 the the heart of the answer is that that those designers did not uh, see long term sediment management as a as a priority. Um, maybe with the thought that you know we'll we'll have better technologies a hundred years down the road to to address that. So, uh, well, we've got some of those, but we uh, we are still in the process of addressing that. Well, and the research continues with the research we're doing amongst the federal agencies, as well as the prize competition idea of opening up ideas uh, in the second stage. It'll be open up to international as well as national folks. The first competition was uh, only U.S. Um, uh, solvers could win cash prizes. So we may see something from that, too. Uh, we hope to try and engage the dredging industry on this as well. I think, too, that, that something to consider is, uh, Paul was alluding to, um, you know, the life of the reservoirs, and when they were first designed, those lifespans seemed to be, you know, quite a ways out into the future, at least two or three generations or more. Um, I think the thing that we're finding, though, is that even though, for example, Lewis and Clark Lake had about a 200-year lifespan, and, um, you know, we're really only a, a fourth of the way or so into that. After, after 50 or 60 years, um, you're really starting to feel the effects of that sedimentation starting to come in. So it comes in fairly gradual, but at some point, you know, when you're starting to lose 30, 40% of the storage capacity in the reservoir, now people and the uses that go on around that reservoir are starting to be impacted. So it, it, it's impacting the economics, impacting social values, and just in general impacting quality of life for a lot of people both on the upper and lower end of that reservoir. So I think, you know, it sort of puts into perspective why we need to be dealing with the sedimentation today. Yeah, I would agree with that, uh, Tim, and certainly in, in what we found for the economic justification of putting in these large projects. Um, you know, it was very basic and it, it made some uh, very broad assumptions of the, the benefits at the current time, but did not include any sort of chronic decay um, of the future uh, value of those benefits. Um, but that is certainly something we are going to attempt to look at with this uh, collaborative sediment management plan uh, with MSAC um, and their partners. Um, we, we intend to apply a number of these uh, you know, economic models that, that, that Tim, Tim uh, Randall showed here uh, and, and, and take a shot at what are the current values, how are, uh, you know, uh, what are the current benefits and impacts, how have they degraded over time, and then make an estimate of how they degrade into the future. And, and, and if, we, if we don't discount them to zero today and we do apply this, this concept that there is inherent and retained real value to those benefits to your children and my children and their grandchildren and the like, um, and we do that type of analysis, then while most of these management actions are very expensive, um, in that type of consideration where we say these, these benefits aren't zero and they do have real value, then some of those sediment management actions may uh, be more justified than they are under the old uh, traditional benefit cost ratio. And maybe one additional point I'll make is that in this sketch, you can see the reservoir here is pretty much full of sediment. But in this one, maybe that's only a quarter full of sediment. And yet, if that outlet works, becomes impaired, that is a serious impact on the reservoir operations. Also, if there's boat marinas or boat ramps that get buried by the delta, that can have a serious effect. Or if you no longer have this area for recreation, that could be a serious impact. And then the starving of sediment to the downstream river channel and the upstream aggradation also have impacts. So the point is you get the impacts long before uh, the reservoir completely fills with sediment. In the example I showed with uh, Peonia Reservoir, 
uh, which I think is back up. Now this example, uh, this reservoir was just 50 years old and about a quarter filled with sediment and starting to have serious impacts. Yeah, and Tim makes a great point there that in many cases, you know, the 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 percentage or the you know percentage lost volume isn't the one and only metric by which we need to look at the need for sustainable management. Uh, as a as a case in point, the core has a small reservoir that's about six percent, five percent storage loss. Um, that storage loss happens to be in an area right in front of a, an emergency gate where there are gravels depositing there creating a significant maintenance um, obstacle for that project to keep those gates clean all the time. So uh, while the Corps and Reclamation, all the big federal dam operators are using um, the percentage lost storage as, a, as an initial cut to prioritizing, we do understand and we are working towards um, the nuances uh, of, of the management impacts that, that aren't simply um, reported by that by that percentage cut, and as we move forward and we try and prioritize where uh, to spend federal dollars to you know sustain some of these reservoirs, um, that will be a critical part of that decision making process. Okay, we do have a, a another question here. Um, and it may relate uh, to the sediment management plan that we're uh, working on for Lewis and Clark Lake. Um, the person asks, has anyone calculated increased sedimentation rates into Lewis and Clark Lake as a result of increased grassland conversion and CRP acreage loss during the last 12 years? And what is the technical technological feasibility of boring through dams to allow sediment pass structures? Well, Sandy, I think I'll probably have to take those and, and uh, Tim Randall may have some follow up on the on the, the second point there. Um, on the on the idea of, of the, the CRP and grassland conversion, I think the, the, the question there relates to there's a, there's a fair amount of land that's come out of those uh, conservation practices um, over over the last decade, um, and and as as a percentage or or uh, as it relates to how much has that increased sediment contribution to say the Niobrara and the Missouri? No, we have not calculated that. Um, we do surveys in that area um, along the rivers and through the reservoir about once every decade. Uh, the current set of surveys was after the 2011 event. They were done in the very late fall of 2011, early 2012. Uh, we have requested uh, federal dollars uh, after this 2019 event to update those, uh, but have not had a positive uh, return on, on that request yet. Um, we have done a number of assessments in that area, primarily on the Niobrara, Bazil Creek, Ponca Creek, and the like, um, about and kind of the partitioning of contribution of sediments and and certainly the overland runoff um, and uh, and the like uh, off of off of uh, production lands is a factor uh, and it does play into that total budget uh, likely a little more um, farther west in the in say the Niobrara watershed than than close to the Missouri uh, the, the 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 majority of sediment that we see being delivered. Um, down the Niobrara and into the Missouri uh, is from bed and bank erosion. Uh, it's a spring-fed river. It's obviously there in the sand hills, and uh, there's almost a, a limitless supply of fine sand in in the bed. Um, so no, we have not quantified that, um, and and it certainly has an impact. Uh, but I think it, its impact is is likely not going to be as significant as the continual. Uh, delivery of sediment um, from the, the bed and banks of the river. Um, on the uh, boring through dams, um, absolutely that can be done. Uh, uh, 
Tim Randall and I have uh, both been to to sites around the world where um, they've they've bored. There's a picture right there. They've uh, at at Miwa, and we we saw one in Taiwan where they they bored a couple of those uh, through the mountain. Um, there is uh, technology to under an existing dam stabilize the dam and cut a 10 foot 20 foot diameter tunnel, put gates on it. Um, and, uh, and, and use it for that. That's, you know, one of the ideas that's been thrown around at, at Lewis and Clark Lake is said, well, if, if we're going to lose all these benefits and, and we need a way to, to maintain this currently, the spillway gates are the only way for sediment to get over, over the dam. Uh, it's not feasible. It'd be destructive to start moving all those sands through the powerhouse. Uh, that'll cause significant damage. Uh, but those spillway gates are, uh, they're about 30, 30 plus feet off the bottom of the reservoir. So when you open the gates, you're taking the top half of the, the water after the sediment's already uh, settled out. So in, in one of the, the, the numerical models, one of the computer models we're using for this study with, with MSAC and the local sponsors, uh, we've simulated putting uh, a set of large tunnels underneath Gavin's Point Dam so that in a drawdown flush scenario where we return the Missouri to a, a run of river condition where it can pick up and scour those sediments and transport them down, uh, the river would then flow through these tunnels at the bottom of the reservoir instead of over the spillway. Uh, and that does greatly increase the efficiency and the amount of sediment you can move in any given uh, event, you know, we kind of quantify that by per acre foot of water, you know, how many units of sand can you, or sediment can you move per unit of water? Um, and that, that ratio goes way up if you have low level flushing gates and, and the like. Uh, so the technology is there. Of course, the, the obstacle to it is, is the economics of it. Um, can we justify a two, three, four hundred million dollar project um, to conserve what benefits we have at the at the reservoir. So that's just kind of a local example. Tim, do you have anything? Tim uh, Randall, anything to add to that? No, I think that that summed that up well. Uh, maybe the only thing to add would be, I think most examples I've seen are going through the rock abutment of the dam, uh, as opposed to actually through the dam. And Paul was talking about going underneath the dam. Uh, that could also be another alternative. A lot of engineers don't like to have holes punch right through the dam, but uh, through the abutments or underneath the dam, probably more likely. Sure, sure. That's a that's a great point. And, and in many of these cases where they're going around, it's it's because they would be punching through a concrete arch dam uh, or some sort of concrete structure. Um, in the case of many of the reservoirs in this part of the world where you're talking about a, a roller compacted earthen uh, dam, uh, you know, you may have more flexibility on where you can, where you can put those tunnels. Right. But it's all technologically feasible. It's just, it's just a question of cost, like you said, Paul. I suppose there might be other methods of um, getting the sediment to the tunnels if it wasn't by flushing or um, maybe even some of those ideas is uh, from the press competition? Well, there's also the turbidity currents. Um, if you have really high sediment concentrations, it may get there for you uh, to the entrance to a low level gate or a tunnel that might be near the dam. Uh, but there's also things like just simply dredging it and putting it in sediment slurry pipelines and taking it distance of tens of miles if it needs to go that far. Yeah, certainly, and and with a with a reservoir that's fairly wide, like Lewis and Clark Lake, uh, another scenario that's that's modeled in our models is uh, uh, a, 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 what would be currently an underwater, essentially training dike uh, that would significantly narrow the width of the the reservoir while it was in a drawn down state. Um, and that may increase increase your efficiency also. Um, we intend to look at as, as part of this uh, analysis here and, and for the folks that may not be uh, directly connected with this analysis, the intent here is to ask these economic questions and, and look at some of these uh, sustainable or life cycle economic models uh, 
uh, in reference to some existing work that the, that the Corps has already done at Lewis and Clark Lake, looking at uh, flushing, drawdown flushing of the reservoir, uh, looking at uh, instituting mechanical dredging uh, and transport of that sediment downstream, and then uh, the concept of doing bed load collection on the major tributaries to, to significantly reduce the load into the reservoir. Um, and then a lot of work has already been done on those. And so uh, in, in, a, in a step to move towards a full sediment management plan, we would, we would leverage a lot of that work that's already been done and ask those economic questions of those three different engineering solutions um, and, and look at look at the uh, the possibilities or what that how does that economic shake up and, and ask those questions early because these are non-traditional methodologies for assessing benefits and, and impacts um, and we would we would apply them uh, to this this Lewis and Clark case study and and uh, hopefully uh, kind of uh, build a framework that uh, our agency and other agencies might use in the future uh, to to look at developing management plans at, at other reservoirs. Um, we do have, have one participant who's raised his hand and we're going to try to uh, unmute him. Um, this is uh, Don Nelson. I have a question as to whether any of these 2020 competition projects might have some specific applicability in the Niobrara River Delta. Oh, that's a that's a good question. Um, trying to relate what what I know of the uh, um, uh, what we saw in the in the competition, and 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 I I do think um, Don that there might might be because a number of these were were kind of designed as uh, uh, in situ collection. Uh, I'm thinking Tim Randall specifically of of the uh, you know the sediment snake uh, field. Um, or the the auger system, or something like that. Um, the, the advantage of of the way that the Niobrara delivers sediment, right, is it's all at that one very local point, uh, right where right at the mouth there, um, and you kind of have a very focused uh, location there. Um, and so I do think uh, you know I've been involved with the with the review and the judging with with Tim Randall, we've got a number of core folks that, that uh, participate in that team. Um, and, and there are things that are similar to like the, uh, you know, the bed load collectors that have been proposed and like, and, and if we were to find one of those that would do a similar type of, of, of uh, collection, maybe even more efficient, um, anything we can do to increase that efficiency of the collection of the sediments on the Niobrara, um, would get us closer to that realization that the one large obstacle I think in any collection on the on the Niobrara uh, is is simply the use of use of the sediment or the the final destination of it and I know we talked about this a little bit at the meetings up in in Niobrara itself it's uh, collecting it we can we can continually push to reduce the cost of collecting it um, and then the the next step is is uh, on that is to continually find a way to reduce the cost of of transporting it um, and the like. So so there's a little bit of balance, right? If we pull it out in the Niobrara, um, and that's I, I can't leverage the reservoir to move it anywhere. Um, I have to move it some other way. If I let it go down and collect it at the delta in Lewis and Clark Lake, then I have the, the lake itself to help me move uh, the sediment. And, and uh, as we've seen throughout history, it is, it is much cheaper, more efficient to move uh, a pound of widgets by water than it is, than it is by land. So, so there's a, a little bit of trade-off there, um, but, but maybe there is a solution there. I'm, I'm optimistic in talking with Tim Randall that a number of these in this next round of the competition 
a number of these ideas may end up as actual pilots, you know, test mini test cases that we set up down at either a, a reclamation or a, a Corps of Engineers lab and kind of kind of move to prove it stage. Um, and if we can get a, you know, a, a mini tabletop or a small lab uh, scale model going, uh, maybe, you know, maybe one day one of those uh, does get put in as a, as a test case on, on the Niobrara. So I'm, I'm hopeful, you know, I can't guarantee anything, Don, but I'm, but I'm hopeful that the, you know, we're going to, we're going to find something. So, Paul, one of the winning projects was to transport the sediment through hydraulic capsules. Right. I'm wondering if I'm wondering if that technology uh, improves the economics of one of the, the currently considered alternatives at Lewis and Clark Lake, and that is to dredge the sediment and move it through a pipeline to Gavin's Point Dam. Boy, it, it sure could, Tim. You know that the. the um, it would we don't have enough clay really to work with the the half of the the technology Tim Randall was talking about with compressed logs so we would we've got say 60 percent you know half to 60 percent fine to medium fine sand and and 30 percent silt um, and the like so we would have to do some sort of of capsule um, enclosed capsule that we would have to, to load or unload or or have a dissolvable capsule or whatever, you know, whatever crazy idea you can think of here. Um, but but that is a, uh, the kind of, of scenario where we think that that might have a possibility because that's a that's a scenario where you're you could build a permanent infrastructure um, because the delta is where the delta is now. Um, and if you were to try and use a technology like that to manage it, you'd probably set up a, uh, an infrastructure to use that hydraulic transport from the, from the delta where it is now and then just try to keep up year to year. Um, and, you know, you have the, you have the bluffs on, on parts of either side of the reservoir, which might allow you to, to put in a, in a, in a, in a permanent pipeline, uh, type of thing. So, um, th that is one that, you know, I, I know on a small scale would work. The, the question is, um, and I think Tim Randall and I both scratched our head on this is like, we have to find the, the loading and the unloading efficiency is, is the threshold concern to make that work on a big scale. Um, and hopefully that's the, one of the things we find out in this next iteration of the, of the challenge competition. Right, I was thinking about Denver water dredging Strontia Springs Reservoir, and it got quite expensive. I believe they were spending $60 a cubic yard, which is when you start really scaling that up to acre feet of sediment, that gets very costly. And, and the big reason was the abrasive characteristics of those sediments. It kept wearing holes through the pipeline. Now they were using high density polyethylene pipe, perhaps steel would have been a more durable. But the idea of putting it in a capsule and the sediment particles are just going for a ride in the capsule would seem like you could eliminate the abrasion problem. There's the durability of the capsules and, the, and as Paul just said, the loading and unloading, if you can do that efficiently, uh, that could be a, a solution that could solve the abrasion problem for transporting coarse sediments over long distances. Well, I think um, we've uh, gone a little bit past an hour. Um, but I think we had a great discussion today, um, and uh, MSAC hopes to do a few more of these uh, in the near future um, this winter on different reservoir sedimentation uh, management topics. Um, if there's anyone, uh, anyone on the panel that has any parting shots, please uh, uh, state your closing. Well, thank you very much, Sandy, for the opportunity to present.
we greatly appreciate it. And I think uh, it's just we need to remember that this isn't um, just a local issue. There is uh, this issue across the United States. And I think that's important to getting some policy change and just uh, ideas moving forward. Thanks, Paul and Tim. And, and um, here in the near future, we'll also update stakeholders on uh, how things are progressing uh, with the sediment management plan for Lewis and Clark Lake. Um, and perhaps uh, to get some feedback from stakeholders, we might try this format as well. Okay. Well, thanks everyone, and we'll be uh, sending you an email um, with some future information. Uh, and everybody, have a good day. Thank you.